Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for September. My name is Hugh Daigle. I'm the director of the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment, and I'm glad you've chosen to join us here today. The Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment is a, an organization with 27 affiliated faculty um, who work on a variety of problems related to all forms of subsurface energy. Uh, we have a broad interdisciplinary research team where we use various subsurface applications to look at conventional oil and gas, unconventionals, carbon capture utilization, and other things related to subsurface energy. Um, we have a diverse background of researchers who work in areas including reservoir engineering, petrophysics, machine learning, data analytics, sustainability, and all other different types of engineering and science. And the tools we use to investigate these problems include everything from laboratory work to large scale simulations and and even small scale simulations, including micro models. So there's a lot of great stuff that we do. Much of our research gets done as part of our industrial affiliate programs, which are listed here. Um, if you go to our website, you can see more information on these IAPs and how to get in touch with the directors. Uh, you can see we cover a large amount of both oil and gas and other types of subsurface energy uh, problems with these IAPs. Our monthly webinars are held on the second Tuesday of each month, and these are intended to be informative and really driven by the problems that you're experiencing out there in industry to help get the work that we're doing here at the university out there to you all. Um, they happen at noon central time, uh, second Tuesday of each month, and we hold them on Teams, and you can follow us on social media for links to the, uh, to the meetings as they come along. Um, if you're not able to make a particular webinar, you can find it um, on our YouTube channel within a few days. And the uh, YouTube channel gets a lot of traffic, and it's pretty nice that we have that up there for people to watch. Um, upcoming webinars on October 8th, we'll have Professor Sharma, and then on November 12th, we'll have Professor uh, Hidari. And I've just got a couple of example slides here of some of the other webinars that we've done recently. We have a sponsorship opportunity for webinars. Um, it's at a level of $5,000 per webinar, and we will feature your logo and your name prominently at the beginning and end of the webinar. Um, this exposes you to a live audience of industry, government, and academia. Um, we publicize this widely to both um, public and private audiences. And then the uh, webinar is archived on our YouTube channel. We've got you know many, many thousands of views uh, just over the last two years. So for you as a sponsor, you reach a global targeted audience. You associate your brand with what we hope is high quality work that we do here. And uh, you in turn support uh, furthering CSEE's mission of research and education in subsurface energy and the environment. So for more information on this, you can feel free to reach out to me. There's my email address, just my last name at austin.utexas.edu. Now, today's webinar, before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of logistical things. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A section, and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. You can ask a question at any point during the webinar as it comes to you. And um, again, remember that we will upload this presentation to YouTube within a few days. So if you've missed something, you can go back and find it there. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Ryosuke Okuno. Um, Dr. Okuno um, is going to be talking about uh, aqueous nanobubble dispersions for uh, geologic carbon sequestration and enhanced oil recovery. Um, uh, Ryosuke has been with the department for several years now. He runs the carbon, um, carbon utilization and storage industrial affiliate program and uh, does a lot of really um, great work here. He, um, let's see, he's um, won numerous awards, um, including teaching award and uh, faculty award. And uh, he did his PhD here actually at UT and uh, came back here after working at um, the uh, uh, University of um, uh, Alberta. So um, with uh, no further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Okuno. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to present uh, recent uh, research progress on APS nanobubble dispersion for geologic carbon sequestration and enhanced oil recovery. So, this presentation is partly based upon the research uh, project under the Energy Simulation Industrial Research Chair Program on Carbon 
utilization and storage at the University of Texas at Austin. So uh, X nanobubble dispersion is a complex uh, fluid and we don't know many things yet. However, the, uh, it has been widely applied for various industrial applications such as uh, wastewater treatment, fishery, and the food industry. Uh, however, these uh, previous applications are primarily operated at ambient conditions in open system. And our application is focused on high pressure uh, nanobubble dispersion for subsurface applications such as geologic carbon sequestration and enhanced oil recovery. So it's quite different from low pressure system. And uh, I hope uh, this presentation um, is uh, useful and uh, uh, interesting for uh, those subsurface uh, applications. So uh, here's the outline. Uh, I'm going to start by fundamental properties of aqueous nanobubble dispersions. And I'm going to present the two uh, potential applications in CO2 mineralization and the enhancer recovery. And then I'm going to conclude the presentation by a list of the tasks to be done for field scale deployment. So uh, I'm starting by uh, showing a high pressure nanobubble uh, dispersion sample in the sapphire cell. Uh, this sapphire cell has internal volume of 15 cc and the pressure here is 3000 PSI. And it looks like a clear water, uh, but this contains good amount of CO2 as nanoscale bubbles. So after deep pressurization, uh, the volume expands to 630 cc from original 15 cc. And uh, this expansion corresponds to uh, in situ gas content of 2.3 mol of CO2 per liter of the uh, water. And uh, this corresponds to 1.5 times inherent solubility of CO2 in the DI water at this temp uh, temperature and the pressure. So after taking uh, um, this uh, low pressure uh, sample, after deep pressurization, we take a low pressure sample in the open system for nano tracking analysis. And uh, you see a uh, brownian motion of uh, nanobubble dispersion for uh, uh, several days until day 10 here. And uh, so day one, you see the bubbles are so energetic and uh, number density is uh, greater than 10 to the power of nine uh, bubbles per cc. So this NTA, nano tracking analysis cannot uh, detect uh, this many uh, bubbles. And but at day seven and 10, uh, you see uh, bubble number density is uh, 10 to the power of eight bubbles per cc. So you see uh, still a uh, um, lot of bubbles even after 10 days of the expansion. And each window here has a um, scale of um, two micron for the widths. So uh, bubbles you see here is a nanoscale. So days one and two uh, are below um, 50 nanometer, as you see in the table below. And over time, the bubble gets larger. And at day 10, the diameter of bubbles is uh, approximately 100 nanometer. So you see this uh, long-term stability of uh, bubbles uh, explains why uh, nanobubble technology has been widely used for uh, low pressure applications, as I mentioned before. But our focus is for high pressure nanobubble dispersion. And unfortunately, uh, currently there's no nano tracking analysis available for a high pressure system to directly track the high pressure nanobubble dispersion. Uh, so here I'm showing a, a schematic interpretation of the, the nanobubble dispersion in the previous slide. So for days one and two, the bubbles were so energetic that uh, they overcome to merge into larger bubbles and escape from water phase to the atmosphere because the system was open. But as time goes, the energy dissipation happens and then the bubbles cannot longer, no longer overcome activation energy and uh, it stays as a metastable uh, state for quite a long time. So uh, again, our focus is on high pressure nanobubble dispersion. So here's a uh, set of data we presented uh, last year. 
And the uh, y-axis is a CO2 concentration in mole per liter, and the horizontal axis is the external pressure of the sample in PSIG. And the uh, red line is inherent solubility of CO2 in DI water, and the black dots are experimental data. So you see that the enhancement of CO2 concentration by nanobubble increases for higher pressure, and uh, for the higher pressure side, the enhancement factor is 1.5 in this case. And we also tested the effect of salinity by using a uh, uh, 13 weight percent NaCl. And uh, in this figure, the bar charts on the left was were taken from the previous slide for 2000 PSI for DI water. And on the right, you see result for the NaCl brine uh, at the 2000 PSI. So red bars shows that the sanity decreased the inherent solubility of CO2 from 1.5 to 0.86, but the uh, uh, nano bubble with uh, NaCl brine enhanced the CO2 content from 0.86 to 1.29 mole per liter. So enhancement factor is again 1.5. And uh, solution pH is important for nanobubble dispersion. So we tested the effect of pH by using sodium formate solution as a buffer solution to generate the nanobubble dispersion. So here I'm showing the two cases, NaCl brine taken from previous slide and the sodium formate solution with a same way ionic strength of 2.4 mole per liter. So you see in comparison to NaCl brine case, uh, Sodium formate solution results in the uh, slightly increased inherent solubility because of uh, pH that is slightly greater than NaCl case. And then using uh, sodium formate solution for nanobubble dispersion, uh, the CO2 concentration was increased from 1 to 1.5 mole per liter. So again, you see that the enhancement factor is 1.5. And it's our general observation for the past several years that the enhancement factor in comparison to inherent solubility ranges from 1.5 to 2 for many uh, nanobubble samples uh, tested without using any additives. And then the gas content measurement is very fundamental to understand the nanobubble dispersions under high pressure. And using a thermodynamic framework, along with the experimental data of gas content, we can get uh, obtain uh, very useful information from about the nanobubble dispersion. So let me briefly go through the thermodynamics of high pressure nanobubble dispersion. So from thermodynamics, the closed system at the fixed temperature, total volume, and the total mole numbers of the components is at equilibrium state when the Helmholtz free energy of the system cannot be reduced for any possible perturbation. So equation below shows uh, this statement. So DA total is the uh, um, total differential of uh, Helmholtz free energy for the total system. And this is a uh, uh, non-negative. And as uh, net mass transfer be between bubble and the surrounding water phase diminishes toward the equilibrium state, this uh, Gibbs free energy term becomes zero due to the zero net mass transfer. And this happens when the equilibrium state is achieved with the DA total being zero. And therefore, we get this uh, um, mechanical constraint that uh, capillary pressure or vapor phase pressure less liquid phase pressure uh, be equal to the product of interfacial area, so interfacial tension and the uh, derivative of surface area with respect to the bubble volume. And this uh, term on the right-hand side is going to be a well-known young laplace equation for spherical bubbles. And a key point here from thermodynamics is that uh, um, we have to specify NC plus three variables for the thermodynamic system of X nanobubble dispersion. And this is the one variable in addition to a conventional two-phase system with a planar interface. And uh, those variables can be temperature, total volume, external pressure, 
and the more numbers of components. And uh, fortunately, they are all measurable in the experiment directory or indirectly. So that's how we can uh, obtain fundamental thermodynamic properties estimated based upon limited amount of data. And another point to mention, as you will see in the next slide, is that uh, the bubbles are important, but the uh, main role of bubbles is to increase the super saturation level for the surrounding water phase. And uh, the bubbles themselves are not the main contribution to the total gas content in the system. So super saturation is uh, very important for high pressure nanobubble uh, dispersion system. So here I'm showing a schematic illustration of super saturation of aqueous phase by tiny bubbles. So on the left, uh, I'm showing here the bulk two phases with a CO2 rich phase and a water rich phase at the CO2 solubility. And in the middle, we have a nanobubble dispersion with a relatively um, larger bubbles than the one on the right. So in which we have smaller bubbles. And if I take a magnified view from uh, the water phase here, so you see CO2 molecules dispersed in the water phase at the solubility limit. And uh, for the middle sample, we get uh, um, bubbles surrounded by CO2 molecules that are greater than the solubility limit on the left. And uh, this super saturation for the surrounding water phase is enhanced when smaller bubbles have a greater capillary pressure. So this is a graphical illustration of uh, what we found from a thermodynamic viewpoint. And uh, from a modeling perspective, it's uh, a challenging to model the metastable region of free energies in this case, water phase that is super saturated by gaseous species. So for example, conventional uh, cubic equation of state like a Penn Robinson equation of state is not fully valid for the metal stable region for our research purpose. And therefore we decided to develop a uh, um, sophisticated uh, thermodynamic model using a Gerg equation of state, which is uh, known to be reliable for metal stable region of free energies. And this equation of state is explicit in Helmholtz free energy. And we couple this equation of state with our uh, minimization algorithm for Helmholtz free energy minimization for thermodynamic computation. Then we apply this uh, model to uh, understand the overall behavior with high pressure nanobubble dispersion. So for example, here I'm showing uh, uh, experimental data of gas content for high pressure nitrogen nanobubble dispersion. And the y-axis is a nitrogen concentration in mole per liter, and the horizontal axis is the pressure in PSIG. And the red line is the inherent solubility of nitrogen. And the dots are experimental data in our um, experiments as published in this paper. So in this case, unlike CO2, nanobubble dispersion enhancement factor is as high as three. And uh, we match the data with a thermodynamic model that we showed in the previous slide. And then we get the uh, um, various parameters that are not directly measurable in the experiment. For example, capillary pressure, radius of bubbles, surface area of bubbles, and number density of uh, bubbles in the system. And then importantly, the model indicates how much of the nitrogen was in the form of molecularly dispersed in the aqueous phase and how much was it in the form of bubbles in the system. And uh, so figure here on the right shows that uh, 10 to 20% of the nitrogen in the system is uh, in the form of bubbles, and uh, 80 to 90 percent of nitrogen in the system are actually molecularly dispersed in the water phase as a super saturated state. So, so key point is the super saturation. Even though we we call this complex fluid as nanobubble, 
So let me summarize what the, we discussed so far before going to applications. So it's possible to solve for thermodynamic properties of Epcus nanobubble fluids based upon gas content data. And uh, existence of bubbles is important to increase the level of gas supersaturation in the aqueous phase. And the bubbles themselves are not the main contribution to the total amount of gas in the aqueous nanobubble dispersion. So now uh, let's move on to application. And then I'm going to start by CO2 mineralization. So in situ CO2 mineralization is a relatively new technology and uh, still there are many unknowns even at the lab scale, but a large scale um, project uh, that is well known is the CalFix project in Iceland. So uh, they have injected uh, more than 100,000 uh, metric tons of CO2 as carbonated water since 2014. And the uh, obvious limitation is the CO2 concentration in the injected water. So their report indicates that their CO2 content in the injection water is less than one mole per liter, which is a typical range of CO2 solubility in brine. So uh, with nitro, for with a nanobubble technology, we expect that we can increase the CO2 content in the injection brine that result in the reduced cost for the uh, water per ton of CO2 injection. And also we expect that the uh, increase of CO2 content in the water is going to enhance kinetics and extent of the CO2 mineralization reactions. So CO2 mineralization has at least two major steps. The first necessary step is a dissolution of metal silicate that release the metal ions such as calcium, and magnesium ions in the solution. And then when those metal ions are exposed to carbonate, then that results in secondary mineral uh, as carbonates. So here I'm showing some snapshots from our previous paper. Uh, so dissolution of basalt surface and then the resulting secondary minerals as uh, um, magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate. And as I said, the nanobubble um, show the enhanced the kinetics and extent of those reactions in the unpublished data. So research tasks on enhanced CO2 mineralization uh, are listed here. So of course, injectivity is a concern because those uh, mafic, ultramafic rock formations are quite tight. And people speculate that reaction-driven cracking might have happened. But uh, this large scale behavior of um, water injections that contain CO2 uh, really requires a field trial. And uh, uh, numerical simulation and the lab scale experiment are useful, but uh, uh, they are quite limited for this large scale um, research questions. And uh, right now we are very active in research on dissolution precipitation mechanisms. And we are testing a, a variety of samples, uh, such as basalt, peridotite, stromatolite, and the mine tailings from different regions to understand the complex reaction pathways and including passivation layers that can happen with the CO2 for dissolution of metal silicates. And uh, in terms of modeling, we are going to present one paper in the upcoming SPATC on coupled uh, phase. Uh, chemical equilibrium computation. And uh, the modeling is quite useful to understand the complex reaction pathways for this CO2 mineralization processes. And uh, last billet point here. So we are also working on enhancing uh, CO2 content in nanobubble dispersion. Uh, and uh, part of it is going to be presented in in the upcoming GHGT conference in Calgary in October. So uh, another application, potential application of nanobubble technology is for enhanced oil recovery. And it's natural to start by carbonated water uh, as an introduction to uh, nanobubble dispersion because basically nanobubble dispersion is the enhanced carbonated water, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So carbonated water has a long history, over 70 years. 
and uh, it's increasing attention again in the context of CCUS and also combination with uh, low salinity water. And uh, carbonated water typically shows elongated uh, gradual oil recovery after breakthrough as shown on the right side here. And uh, many papers explained the various mechanisms of carbonated water injection for EOR, such as oil swelling, viscosity reduction, wettability alteration, improved contact with the uh, trapped oil, and the interface mass transfer of CO2 from water phase to the lake phase ahead of it. And with nanobubble technology, we are particularly interested in um, significant enhancement of this uh, mechanism highlighted here, which is the interface mass transfer of CO2. So idea is to uh, activate um, locally the CO2 flood at the displacement front uh, in which the uh, nanobubble is going to make CO2 less stable in the system when it's exposed to oil at the displacement front. And that results in uh, CO2 gas nucleation at the front. And uh, partly, the mechanism is uh, implied in previous very interesting paper from uh, Dr. Sorabi at the uh, Harry Watt University. So they published a series of very interesting papers on carbonated water. And the uh, particular result shown here is um, their core floods with live oil. And the one case is uh, water flooding and the other case is the carbonated water flooding. And uh, the, the blue line is a water case and the pink one is a carbonated water. So this live oil core flood using two cases clearly show the, um, the difference from the previous slide of uh, gradual oil recovery after breakthrough. So here you see uh, oil recovery upon the breakthrough time is much enhanced by using carbonated water for this live oil flooding. And they explained uh, the mechanism by using a separate experiment using microfluidics under high pressure. So uh, in this dead oil displacement by carbonated water in the microfluidics shows the, um, the brown as oil and the uh, light brown as the CO2 rich phase nucleated from the water phase, which is transparent here. And this uh, CO2 rich phase is enhanced when they did the same experiment using live oil instead of dead oil. So key point here is that uh, the volatile component, amount of volatile component is very important to have this mechanism locally activated between water phase and oleic phase in the displacement process. So uh, to test the idea, we had a preliminary experiment with dead oil and presented in the previous SPIOR conference. So dead oil was uh, displaced in the core flood in three cases. First case is uh, ordinary water flood with brine. And the uh, second case is uh, carbonated water with a CO2 concentration slightly above solubility. And the last one is a CO2 narrow bubble dispersion injection. And here I'm showing the phase diagram for the CO2 and dead oil at the uh, injection temperature, 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, injection pressure, 2263 PSI. So at the injection temperature pressure, the CO2 and dead oil show the liquid, liquid separation between oil and the liquid CO2. And uh, this uh, partially immiscible phase behavior is more immiscible than the um, dead oil water immiscible system. So if we can activate the CO2 displacement at the front of the displacement process, then the uh, conventional immiscible displacement by water turns into the CO2 partially immiscible displacement of dead oil in this case. So uh, we use uh, various sandstone cores with a permeability of 100 mDRC and porosity of 20%. Uh, 
And the uh, results are shown here. So y-axis is oil recovery in percent OIP, and the horizontal axis is uh, hydrocarbon forward injected. And the NSU brine ordinary water flooding case is shown by circle. And uh, carbonated water with a uh, CO2 concentration slightly above solubility is uh, shown by triangles. And diamonds are nanobubble case. So you see that uh, unlike the carbonated water case, CO2 nanobubble case uh, showed a significant increase in oil recovery upon the breakthrough time, which we would like much more than the gradual elongated incremental oil recovery after breakthrough. And we hypothesize that uh, this is a uh, impact of CO2 gas nucleation on the fraction flow in the displacement process. And we are still investigating uh, details of the mechanism in a systematic manner, experimentally and numerically. So another example is a half and puff experiment for tight um, sandstone. So uh, we use the Kentucky sandstone with a permeability of 0.6 millidarcy and porosity of 15%. Uh, and uh, we use the live oil with a nitrogen uh, nanobubble half and puff, and uh, we compared with a supercritical CO2 half and puff. So thermodynamic MMP for this uh, CO2 live oil pair at uh, 216 degrees Fahrenheit was 2540 PSI A. And uh, our uh, pressure for injection and soaking uh, periods was uh, 1400 PSI A and uh, production pressure was about 3,500 PSI. And the soaking time was 13 hours. So uh, we started the experiment by uh, brine soaking, and then the results shown here in this figure are the oil recovery after the brine soaking period. So uh, y-axis is the cumulative improved oil recovery in percent uh, OO, IP after uh, brine stage. And uh, you see that the nanobubble case systematically increased oil recovery in comparison to supercritical CO2 half and pop case. And especially for the first cycle, improved oil recovery with nanobubble dispersion was uh, twice as much as the other case. And uh, there are so many unknowns yet, but uh, we believe that uh, this uh, the enhanced gas content that result in a CO2 nucleation in the porous media is a, one of the major mechanisms that cause this enhanced oil recovery. So uh, I'm going to show here the list of uh, tasks to be done uh, for the um, next stages. So uh, first, we would like to increase CO2 content in high pressure nanobubble dispersion, for example, up to five mol per liter which is equivalent to five tons of brine per ton of pure CO2 without using um, uh, additives. And uh, we are working on steady state generation of CO2 nanobubble. And uh, also for uh, practical application, it's important to confirm shear stability and the operating conditions. And uh, we are also working on development of experimental device to directly measure bubble properties under high pressure. And we are going to soon start the live oil PVT with a nanobubble dispersion. Uh, and then we are going to do uh, many core floods and half and puff to um, systematically understand the detailed mechanisms and also imply uh, important uh, uh, factors for field scale applications. And part of it is analysis using fraction for theory as I mentioned previously. And the most likely we would like to need uh, um, some uh, uh, technology development in numerical simulation for high pressure nanobubble system. And uh, please email me at uh, okuno at utexas.edu if you'd like us to work on nanobubble research for your specific field conditions. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank to our sponsors for our team. Uh, and uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. What is the density difference between the fluid with without the CO2? So uh, 
based upon our understanding, uh, I think a good uh, reference is the density of uh, carbonated water uh, under the selective temperature pressure condition, because uh, it, it's it's uh, basically enhanced the carbonated water, but uh, the density is dominated by the aqueous phase. So, would the presence of strong acid affect the stability of nanobubbles? So, uh, the pH is uh, quite important for the nanobubble dispersion. And the uh, um, literature so far shows that the uh, uh, stability of nanobubbles are enhanced uh, for higher pH environment. But uh, for high pressure nanobubble system, uh, many things are unknown, including this question. So, so it's a really good question. What options are you evaluating for steady state nanobubble generation? <laughs> yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so uh, we used a porous membrane before, and then part of the result uh, I showed in this today's presentation are based upon that. However, um, we are testing other methods of steady state nanobubble generation instead of batch preparation. And uh, um, that part, unfortunately, I cannot uh, present the details here because of confidentiality terms for uh, the sponsors. So, so in carbonate environment, will there be some reactivity with the rock matrix to further enhance the characteristics of a super saturated CO2 in solution? Okay, so I, I assume uh, the question referred to uh, CO2 generated because of a dissolution of a calcite in carbonate. Um, we, we haven't tested uh, this interesting question, but uh, of course uh, we would like to um, you know, investigate the impact of a, the dissolution of calcite when nanobubble is injected in the carbonate because some project we have are investigating uh, potential CO2 mineralization in carbonates. And uh, so, but in general, generation of nanobubble requires some sort of mixing. And uh, I'm not fully sure how uh, CO2 generated upon dissolution of calcite is going to contribute to the uh, nanobubble um, in the solution. So um, it's a really good question. Uh, let me investigate as as we have time. Okay, so yeah, I we we are expanding the research uh, program on nanobubble technology in many ways, and uh, uh, mainly focused on field scale deployment, and that's why I listed the uh, um, the steady state generation of nanobubble for high pressure applications as part of the list. And also we have very unique capabilities and uh, um, uh, motivated students who are ready to work on challenging tasks. And uh, one of them includes uh, some of that modeling of nanobubble dispersion under high pressure. Um, that is quite unique to our research team. So uh, please let me know if we, you have any questions or potential uh, projects with us. <clears throat> 